Hello, I'm Sabrina. I'm one of the respiratory therapists at the K Edmonton Clinic that helps out in the interstitial lung disease clinic. Today we're here with um, one of the patients in the ILD clinic, Corey, who's welcomed us to his backyard just to discuss a bit about interstitial lung disease and oxygen therapy. Interstitial lung disease um, is an umbrella term for a group of disorders that cause inflammation and fibrosis or scarring in the lungs. And that fibrosis or scarring causes stiffness in the lungs, which can make it hard for oxygen to get into the bloodstream. And that's why oxygen therapy can be such a wonderful tool for these patients to use. So we're gonna to talk to Corey a little bit about his journey with oxygen therapy. How long have you been on oxygen, Corey? Um, I've been on oxygen since uh, January of 2019. And this wasn't my first go round. I had had an illness a number of years prior to that, which um, sort of did the initial damage to my lungs. And I spent some time on oxygen surrounding that particular time as well. Um, so it wasn't brand new in 2019 when that happened. Essentially the trigger to, uh, to my lung disease was an autoimmune disorder that uh, attacked the blood vessels in my lungs. That happened in the fall of 2014. It landed me at the U of A where I spent probably close to three weeks in the ICU. I was intubated twice. I received an open lung biopsy. Have you had any ER visits recently, Corey, or any um, visits to the hospital in terms of your, your breathing issues? No, none, none for years. And that's wonderful. Just again, showing the benefits of having oxygen therapy and having it optimized to the levels that you need to have. I qualified simply by being too low in terms of my, uh, my oxygen data. So that data is measured in a couple of ways. Um, one is very non-invasive with a pulse oximeter on the finger and seeing what your oxygenation levels are reading. The other is far more invasive and that is something called a blood gas test. A blood gas test is a needle into the vein in your wrist. And so those numbers you have to fall below a certain benchmark. I have no idea what the benchmark is, but you have to fall below it in order to qualify for funding through Alberta Health. Absolutely, and just to clarify, so it's actually um, your artery. Artery. In, yeah, your radial artery that would be poked at that time in order to get that um, evaluation of how much oxygen is in your bloodstream. So we've talked about every patient needs a different levels of oxygen. Patients typically will either get started on home oxygen in hospital, which can look a little bit different than if we're starting them in the clinic space. So starting them on oxygen um, via the hospital route, typically, as mentioned, happens with an arterial blood gas. Then you go forward on that oxygen set up by the company. The beneficial part about our clinic and being able to monitor these patients is having the ability to do a walking oxygen titration. So that's something that we do in our clinic. I know as well, um, different home care vendors can do that, home care RTs um, or private companies as well that set up oxygen. So this is when we're taking the patient with their oxygen on a walk at their own pace. We're monitoring with their saturation probe what their oxygen levels are. And then we can see whether we need to go up or go down, depending on what's happening. We record how long they're able to walk, what kind of distance they're walking, and that gives us a good idea to figure out for that specific patient at that time, how much oxygen is reasonable for them. What we're looking for is to make sure that their shortness of breath is improved um, with the use of the oxygen and that we can keep their oxygen saturations to a higher level with the oxygen. So every patient is different. Um, it's nice to have that personalized experience with your healthcare provider in order to determine what's right for you. I understand there was some initial challenges with the oxygen therapy in its settings. Can you tell us more about that? My mindset was wrapped around trying to reduce the flow rate as best as I could and trying to find opportunities where I could function even without using oxygen. Ultimately, I think that led to some frustration on my part 
Um, I think there was some miscommunication between me and my previous doctor. And uh, that led me to seek some different voice. And that voice ultimately through referral ended up being uh, Dr. Kaluri. And uh, I remember that first meeting in her office. I brought my wife, I brought my mother-in-law with me and Dr. Kaluri was very succinct. And she said, how often do you breathe? Well, the answer to that is all the time. Well, if you need oxygen when you're breathing some of the time, why don't you need it all of the time? And that's an outstanding question, one that leaves you with the obvious answer, and that is you need oxygen. And so that kind of began the journey towards using oxygen full time. Probably the biggest hurdle at that point was a mental one, because I needed to put myself into the mindset where I could go to work using oxygen. Work was one place where I had avoided it. I would leave my canisters in my vehicle in the parking lot. And I would go in, do my job, and then when I would come back out to my vehicle, I would put the oxygen back under my nose. It was hard to make that adjustment. And I remember my first day back, and it turned out we had a, a staff meeting that day, and. I'm pretty candid with people. I tend to, you know, let people know what I'm thinking and I'm not shy about that. And I said to my colleagues, I can look around this room today and I cannot tell which one or any of you are on heart medication or blood pressure medication or antidepressants or anything else. But every one of you can see what my medication is. And that is such a fundamental difference about being on home oxygen versus almost any other kind of medical treatment. It is observable. It is something that anybody can see and ultimately draw their own conclusion about. Uh, this guy must have been a smoker. Nope, not one time in my life. This guy must, uh, you know, work in some industry and has breathed in a bunch of stuff. Nope, these hands have not done manual labor. It just was the random occurrence of, of medical stuff that landed me here. Dealing with flow rates and other things, once um, I'd made that commitment to use external oxygen uh, full time, that's relatively easy. I have a pulse oximeter. I have an Apple watch that will measure your blood oxygen levels. And I have a pretty good feel for when I've overexerted and need to bump myself up as well. So I have pretty good control over that. The biggest challenge was frankly facing people and being in a job where I am forward facing on a number of occasions, not just with people that I immediately work with in my office and in our building, but with people across all of Alberta and even across the country where you may not have the same connection, the same relationship and the same ability to explain. That's been as big a challenge as any. So I find a lot of patients struggle with the concept of what exertion really means. We typically talk about two settings. We talk about rest settings and exertion settings. So exertion would be anything that is increasing your energy level. Um, the most common thing people think of is walking, which definitely counts. But there's many other things that fall into the category of exertion. So whether that be getting dressed in the morning, taking a shower, eating or even talking can all be part of what we consider exertion where you're going to expend more energy and therefore need to increase your oxygen levels to meet those demands. Corey, what changed for you in order to find the right oxygen levels? Probably the best example of being at rest, it's going to sound odd, but being in the vehicle, right? It's not a physically demanding thing. You are sitting. I can do that on 
a flow rate generally of two to three liters per minute. Any exertion though, and we are up at a range of six to, to 10, depending on the activity. At home, you don't have the same way to easily adjust. A, a plug-in concentrator machine can of course be adjusted, but unless you're sitting immediately beside the machine, it's more of a set it and forget it. So I leave my home machine set at around eight, which allows me to comfortably go about my business and do the kinds of things that I would normally uh, do at home. Uh, go from downstairs to upstairs, take a shower, go to the bathroom, making dinner, loading or unloading laundry, things of that nature. Like you said too, there's no such thing as too much. So if I'm on the couch watching television and the flow rate is higher than I need it to be, that's fine. So it sounds like you have a, a different, you know, um, types of equipment to help you with your oxygen therapy. Working with your respiratory therapist and the home oxygen company, you can um, go through different types of equipment available in order to find the best thing to suit your lifestyle to enable you to continue to do as much as possible. Different options, there's um, pulse devices out there called POCs, um, and then there's continuous flow cylinders. So um, the pulse oxygen would give you a burst or a pulse of oxygen when you're breathing in, um, compared to a continuous flow, which is in that continuous amount of oxygen no matter what you're doing. In patients with ILD, we highly recommend going with a cylinder option with a continuous flow. That way you have the ability to vary it up and down. Um, with some of the pulse um, concentrators out there or pulse portable devices, they tend to run at lower flows. So it's quite limiting, unfortunately, um, when it comes to titrating that up and down or you know putting it onto a continuous flow mode, they typically have that option. But again, it's quite low flows. So, Going with the cylinder is a great idea to be able to use that movement, to be able to be you know, on very low oxygen potentially when you're resting, and then going up very high if you need to on that exertion. So we're here in Corey's home um, to see his home oxygen setup. Corey, can you show us what you have? Sure. Um, primarily right here is my uh, plug-in concentrator. It is a 10 liter concentrator adjustable by a knob and it's pretty much set it and forget it. Uh, turn the power on and uh, away it goes. Uh, we don't even notice the sound anymore because it's just become such a regular part of our life. We have it here in our home in our entryway slash living room for a couple of reasons. One, it's easy access coming in and out of the house to switch from a canister to the concentrator. And number two, this room really has gone to the dogs. Um, we spend very little time in this room. It's the dog's space, so it's not really in our way. Um, the areas of our home where we spend more time can be sequestered from the sound and the little bit of heat that the uh, concentrator machine uh, may give off. I have a 50 foot hose that is attached to the concentrator. It does not restrict the flow at all. Um, I don't think you'd want to go with a longer length because I think the concentrator would have difficulty pushing the oxygen through uh, to the cannula. So it's a 50 foot hose attached to a seven foot um, additional hose with the, with the nasal uh, cannula on it. And this gets me anywhere I need to be within my house. In 2008, I was diagnosed with obstructive sleep apnea, and that's why I have a CPAP machine. Um, it is not an alternative to supplemental oxygen. Um, if you have ILD and obstructive sleep apnea, they work together. But one is definitely not a substitute for the other. We have the, uh, the tube, we have the mask, and we have 
what I simply call the, the titration device. So the titration device plugs neatly into the tube and also into the mask. And there is a small valve in the titration device that allows you to take your oxygen tube from your concentrator and plug it in like so. We have a few things here in the back of the car. We'll start with uh, the red pouch. Uh, the red pouch is basically the, uh, the carrier for what is referred to as a size D, as in Delta, uh, tank. And it's, at least for me, the smallest of the portable tanks that I use. Um, it comes with me in the car. It can ride easily either as a passenger in the front seat or if there is a human passenger in the front seat, it fits quite well um, down by my leg and does not interfere with uh, my ability to drive. If I'm going in and out somewhere for a relatively short period of time, it's what will come with me as well. Um, I've got a, uh, a case of, uh, of full D-sized tanks here with me that should easily get me through uh, the weekend. And so um, I lay them down in this little uh, two liter drink container and it seems to do quite well at keeping them in place and preventing the rattle. The other items we have here are my E, as in Edward, tank. And uh, this one is not quite twice as large as a D tank. And it, of course, has a, uh, a wheeled cart that comes along with it. And it is uh, portable in that way. So if I'm going somewhere where I might be uh, walking a longer distance or staying away from an oxygen concentrator for a longer period of time, these are what's going uh, to come with me. So Corey, what benefits have you found using oxygen therapy? It allows me to continue to basically function. I think of what life would be like if I did not have oxygen. And I would probably be largely a bedridden person. Without question, there are pieces of my life prior to uh, being an oxygen patient that are gone. And that's also part of the mental health processing of this type of circumstance. But just because those things are gone doesn't mean everything else needs to be. I can't imagine as a 48 year old person being in a bedridden circumstance. And because I'm on oxygen means that I'm not in a bedridden circumstance. I get to do all the fun stuff like laundry and, and uh, helping with meals and, and that sort of thing. But I also get to get in my car and be independent and go do largely whatever I like. I get to go to work, which may not sound like a win, but for me, it's a huge win. I get to interact with my colleagues, with other people that I encounter through work. I get to feel a sense of accomplishment and efficacy that if I was bedridden at home would be completely gone. It still allows me to do those fundamental pieces and things that give life meaning. So in our clinic, um, it's really nice to have, you know, the multidisciplinary team to make sure that patients like Corey have that right amount of oxygen. Um, without the oxygen, your oxygen saturations will drop and that causes a lot of impacts to the health of your body. It causes a lot of strain on your brain, on your heart, and of course your lungs. Um, it can cause thickening of the arteries in your heart, which can lead to added stress and other complications such as pulmonary hypertension. And that's why we stress the importance of using the oxygen. So my advice to anybody would be simply to be compliant with your doctor. But at the end of the day, 
your doctor is a medical professional and you need to trust these people when they say this is what you need to do. I guarantee that if you take a weekend and try supplemental oxygen, if it's been prescribed to you, you will notice a difference. Reach out through your doctor to Dr. Kaluri. I'd be happy to talk to you because I think there's gotta be more than just, more than just me out there. So we can do it and we can work together and uh, help each other overcome and deal with some of the mental challenges around this diagnosis.